Hello, everyone. I want to start by thanking everyone for uh, attending the uh, Wharf Essentials topics. This uh, topic is going to be its kind of a variety of topics coming out of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. We're really lucky to have a, a, supervi a primary supervisor, supervisory examiner with us today, Catherine Mitchell. And I wanted to uh, start out by just announcing the Wharf Essential topics. It's a seminar series that covers various topics of interest to technology transfer at the UW-Madison community. We're actually gonna have another one next Monday. I think it's around diversity, the importance of diversity and entrepreneurship. So that one is Monday. I believe it runs from 4 to 5.30. So if you're not doing anything next Monday, feel free to come back down to the forum and uh, par participate in that, uh, that seminar. So let me start today by uh, introducing Catherine Mitchell. She uh, received her degree in chemical engineering from the University of Virginia in 1986. While at UVA, she interned twice for the Nucle Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the Nuclear Reactor Regulations area, which had to be very interesting. Oh, I, you're yes. not glowing, right? So that's OK. I saw Three Mile Island. <laughs> <laughs> After graduation, she worked for a Fortune 100 company as a process and project engineer for nine years before moving to DC. She then worked as an environmental engineering contractor for the Department of Defense before starting at the USPTO in March of 2001, where she examined applications in environmental remediation, road structures, hydraulic and earth engineering, mining beds, seals, drilling and oil wells, jewelry and fasteners, so rather a diverse set of technologies there. Uh, she became a, pri uh, became a supervisory pri patent examiner for an art unit working in movable closures flexible panels and ladders, fire escapes, and scaffolds in January 2008. Her work as, as an examiner with numerous pro se, so that's the lawyer-free lawyer applicants, uh, led her to volunteer as a presenter at the Independent Inventors Conference and numerous programs with the Smithsonian Institute, the Girl Scouts, the uh, Sally Ride Science Toy Challenge, and school innovation competitions. She also has served as a trainer at the Patent Training Academy and a hiring interviewer and recruiter. As a university outreach representative, she encourages universities and students in, new, in engineering, science, business, law, and medical schools to incorporate intellectual property issues in their curricula and to familiarize students with the patenting process and possibilities while still in school. Uh, she also has a personal connection to Wisconsin as her late mother, was a lifelong cheesehead and a huge fan of the Green Bay Packers, Bart Starr, and Vince Lombardi, which we can all appreciate. So go Pack Go. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Examiner Mitchell. Hi. Hi. Oh, thank you. Uh, before I kind of get started, I'll just, uh, in case somebody didn't hear it, we brought hard copies of the basic presentations that we choose from when we give them. And so if you have, if you look at something and you think, I wish you'd covered that one, if you sign up with your email address, I can send you those electronically. They're all approved for distribution. And one of the main things that we come out for is to encourage people kind of to demystify the process and explain a little bit. You don't have to invent cold fusion to get a patent. You can make a little bitty improvement on a ladder. And people laugh at ladders. It is a huge backlog. Apparently, everyone thinks they have a better way to support a ladder or hang a paint can off of it. And that is perfectly patentable. It's just a small improvement. And that's kind of the basis for the patent system, is that in exchange for telling the world enough about your invention that someone else can make and use it, we will give the inventor exclusive rights to his invention for basically 20 years. And, um, and that, that foundation back in Thomas Jefferson's day was really very in a, uh, novel. No other country did that. Basically, the, the feudal lords owned whatever you thought of. Now, if you work at a university, it's quite likely that you signed a contract to say, you know, your inventions you know, are assigned to them. But you will still be the inventor. You will, we will never, well, I won't say never, but we do not issue a patent to a company or to a university. They, they may own all the rights to it, but that was an agreement with you and the university. So I always, one of the things universities are often curious about is they'll come up and say, well, I used to work at the University of Michigan, and now I came over here, and I'm getting the patent now, and they claim they want I'm like, we don't get into that. <laughs> but you know that's probably part of the tech transfer and your contract of employment. And uh, so all that we will say is every inventor should be listed on a patent, even some, you know, anyone who contributed to that. And that's all we care about. We don't care who makes money on it. Um, we hope someone does. But um, 
anyway, so that uh, one little piece of background. But the other thing is we the America Invents Act, which was uh, almost two years ago, it became effective in March of 2013, significantly changed the office in a way that affects inventors. We now have a, a category called micro entity. And the important thing there is the fees are just 25% of our regular fee. There are a few fees that are not reduced. Most of those are things that you had control over and just didn't do it. Um, but anything like filing fees, claim fees, um, et cetera, extension of time, issue fees, those are all 25%. Because the office does want to encourage you know, people to you know, use the IP system. IP is intellectual property. And um, one of the things that, you know, we have a, a list on our website of qualified uh, registered patent agents and attorneys. And you're certainly, in, you know, you're encouraged to use them, but they are expensive. They have to have a science or engineering background. They have to have a law degree, pass a special exam. And um, that doesn't come cheap. And the office realized that we could work with small inventors. So we have improved things. We have an office of uh, what's it called? The uh, Office of Innovation Development, and we have a small an inventors assistance center. Um, our website will walk you through on uh, how to apply for a patent, and you can call the Independent Inventors Assistance Center, and they'll help you with fees and forms. And uh, so you don't really have to have a lawyer or an agent at all. That said probably you'll get a slightly stronger or broader patent with them, but it will cost a lot more money. And um, so if I invented cold fusion, I'll be honest, I'd find the most expensive patent attorney I could find. I would want that office to, you know, reject it a hundred times so that every art that could be applied is, and uh, that makes your record stronger. If you get a first action issue, you might think, hot diggity. <laughs> we were talking, you're probably going to think one of two things. I probably didn't have to claim all of that. Maybe I claimed something too narrowly. Or, uh-oh, what if they just didn't care and it's not really valid? And uh, so when you get a first action, it's usually going to be a rejection. And the point of that is we found the best art that we could based on the claims that were in front of us. And we give you an opportunity to come back and argue it and amend the claims. And that's important because that builds the record so that if you make a, a ton of money on it, your competitors will want to sue you for invalidation, saying that we shouldn't have issued that patent. We didn't know what we were doing. And we have an example of that. And um, if the record is silent, you know, it's pretty easy that you might lose. <laughs> but if the record is clear, then anyone can sue you, but the odds are pretty good that they won't collect. And the same thing, everyone sees the Shark Tank probably where they you know, talk about the, the patent trolls that they get patents, they have no intention of ever selling or developing, and they just want to go after people and say, you're infringing on my patent, give me $100,000 and I'll let you go. And we can't stop that if it's legitimate. You know, they, they actually had an inventor that did it. But if the patent is strong, if your patent is strong, then you have a much better chance of saying, no, -uh, I'm, I'm good. So when you get an office action, don't always think, uh-oh, why are they being this mean? I always think it's the nicest thing that the office can do to be as rigorous as possible, with the caveat that once you've made the record clear, once you explain to us why it, it doesn't make sense to do that, then we should withdraw the rejection. And there are avenues for you if you don't agree with us, and we'll get into that. So that's an overview that's completely off topic. Um, <laughs> And uh, again, this was a uh, we are uh, we are required by the U.S. Constitution. I like to say that while no job is guaranteed, it will take martial law to get rid of mine, and that makes me feel very good. <laughs> and um, uh, so uh, you have an idea, and you want to know what should I do. The most important thing is to start documenting it to yourself. Uh, I suggest a notebook that doesn't have loose leaf pages because you want to be able, especially now, it used to be that it was first to, to invent. That if you invented something and you didn't quite get around to going to the patent office and then somebody else independently invented it, which can happen, um, and they did it a year after you, but they beat you to the office, they win, they get the patent. And the America Invents Act changed that. We are now first to file with the caveat that you still have to invent it. 
Some countries just say, first to file, we don't care where you stole it from, you got here first. We still say you have to be able to swear under penalties of perjury that you are the inventor. But as long as you are the inventor, if you get to the office before the other inventor, you, uh, you win. Doesn't matter who has the earliest date. But it's still good to document things. And the thing, and I have an example of it, that is really sad as an examiner when you have to do it. If you disclose your invention to the public more than a year before you file anything, provisional or non-provisional, that's called a statutory bar. And if we find out about it, we will reject it using your own invention. And I did that probably three or four times. And you feel really badly. This person had a patentable idea, but he just couldn't resist. And y'all are all academic, or likely all academics, and the publisher perish thing, and they just couldn't wait to go to a show or a, a convention or a, you know, and they all publish notes and we find them and we go, oops. So I encourage you, you know, we understand, but just file a, a provisional application, which is very inexpensive. It's like $75. We don't know fees, but I have a list. And um, it's never examined, but it kind of locks your date in. And then you have a year from that provisional to get your, your what's called an, uh, a non-provisional or utility patent filed. And you can say patent pending from the day you file your provisional. So I really encourage if you're going to go to a trade show or a, um, you know a technical convention, whatever, don't don't think. Well, I just had slides. I didn't make a book. If they, it's considered disclosed to the public. The one exception to disclose to the public is the patent office. I didn't realize this for years that if you tell us about it, it's okay. We, we're not the public, and um, so okay. So anyway, you have um, this notebook, and it is, oh, the non-disclosure agreement. Let's say that you're not very good at drawing, so you hire an outside draftsman or whatever. Make them sign a non-disclosure agreement. That covers you that even though you disclosed it to them, it's not considered disclosed to the public if you have a non-disclosure agreement. Um, the provisional, uh, a lot of people are more interested in this than I thought, but it does lock in your filing date and it starts your clock ticking, as they say. And again, it protects against public disclosure. Oh, the fee is $65 for micro entity. And on the fees here, you know, I have a, um, they're the most recent that we, but tomorrow they could change and they probably wouldn't tell us for a couple of months. Our website always has the most current fees. So and the other thing I'll say, no matter who you speak to at the patent office, if we are wrong, we are really sorry, but it doesn't, it won't do you any good to say, well, Catherine Mitchell told me. Catherine Mitchell will be sorry, but we are governed by Congress and the laws, and we do not have the authority to waive it. So always look for it in writing, and, and even that, if, if in writing we tell you wrong, we're, we're, we're still sorry. But you can go you know, and, and make sure for yourself and um, as much as you can, because like a lot of times, I'll say, um, I really can't, can't tell you that because I really don't know. And it just means, you know, I really don't know. And there's no point in telling you that um, we used to, for example, have a, the most embarrassing thing the office did. We charged you $180. We charged your family $180 if you died. You had to have a petition to rename the inventor. We did finally get rid of that. Even we drew the line on charging somebody 180 bucks to die. But I know about that for years that we, and I was commenting on, I can't believe we did. And they said, no, no, they got rid of that. So, you know, there are weird things you have to do. And um, so we have uh, the, the three entities, um, the regular small entity is half price and a micro entity is a quarter of the price. And it has income limits, you have, uh, a limit of how many applications you can do. And a, a lot of universities fall into the micro entity too. And a utility application is the strongest applicant patent you can get. We believe that a US patent is also the strongest of any utility patent that you will get. And that I think is pretty much universally thought of. Uh, no patent on earth covers, uh, is universal. A US patent is only enforceable from others making or selling in the United States. So if you have the world's best, strongest US patent, somebody in France or Japan or India can have at it. And there's, your patent doesn't protect you against that. But they can't import it. And we do have 
uh, um, agreements with other countries that give you a limited amount of protection. There is the PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty. Again, that doesn't grant patent rights, but what it does is you do this one thing and then you can file what are called national stages, which are actual patents in, I think it's like 180 different countries, one at a time. So if somebody ever tells you they have a worldwide patent, they're wrong, there's no such thing. And um, so the, uh, the utility application, which is, um, this is what's in the Constitution, that it says that you are entitled to exclusive rights for machines, articles of manufacture, processes, composition of matter, and improvements. And of course, the Supreme Court is just having a field day trying to figure out what those categories mean. And um, the most up in flux one is business methods and gene and genetics. Um, so I won't get into the the because no one really knows what's going on there too much. Genes seem to have been somewhat uh, clarified by the Myriad decision, but there are so many uh, business methods and software issues that no one exactly knows. And but hopefully no one here is really interested in that. But if so, no one in the office is going to be able to. We're just going to say it's in flux. That's what we were told to say. It's in flux. So the non-provisional application is the, quote, real application. And it's actually examined. And if it's granted, you get the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, or importing the invention into the US and any of our territories. And it's a 20-year term from the date of filing. Now, from that date, let's say that we just drag our feet. We don't get around to doing something timely. The examiner got sick, whatever. Then we give you a patent term adjustment, and however many days we dragged our feet past what we should have taken, we add to the term of your patent, but you don't get a free patent just because we were late. Sometimes people think, well, you didn't get that deadline, so I get it, and that's not how it works. And, uh, but the flip side is you also have deadlines. Generally, the first three months for any response period are free, and the next three months you pay each month a higher and higher fee. So if you're looking to save money, I can tell you you want to, you're out, your office action will say you know, what your, your time period is, and it usually says three months from the date of filing. And that is any time within there you can respond, no charge. If you do it four months, there's a fee. Six, uh, six months, which is an additional three months, is, is a lot more expensive. It goes up almost exponentially. So that's a good way to... Um, save some money is to do things timely. Design applications, I'll just kind of glance over. They're um, a little bit different than a utility. They don't have claims, for example, and they don't have provisionals. They're cheaper. They only go for 14 years from the date of issue, not filing. And they're obviously, it's just the design. Um, oh, this is the PCT. Um, it does not grant a patent. I'm going kind of fast because we don't have, but there is a question and answer session afterwards if I'm going too, too fast. Pro se, uh, that means that you don't have a lawyer. Um, we will go out of our way to try to help a pro se. We have something called constructive assistance. And if you ask for that, the examiner will, will assist you. But it would be disingenuous, as the board likes to say, to say that we will necessarily think of the absolute broadest claim you're entitled to. What we will do is say, well, I'm, I'm comfortable with this. And that's when sometimes an attorney can probably get you slightly broader or stronger claims by you know, arguing a point that, no, we didn't really think about that. Or, and I'm not saying we're stupid. I guess I just did. But um, uh, <laughs> what I am saying is that um, we can definitely, you know, if you don't know at all what to do, you ask the examiner for assistance, and they will help you. And the, again, the Independent Inventors Assistance Center, the numbers on our website, USPTO.gov, um, will really help you. And again, we have registered uh, patent attorneys or agents. They are regulated. We give them a registration number. I will say off the top of, I think it's, it's legitimate. If you see those late night infomercials, those people that um, save your money, um, we can't make them go away. But we, that's the largest group of things that we get uh, complaints about. We have an Office of Enrollment and Discipline. And the feedback is that that it's not, they, they sound better than they are. They, they sound like they're going to be cheap, but you know, it's almost like a 
it, oh, I don't want it. Uh, we would recommend that you get someone off of our list on the internet, uh, on our website. Uh, okay, uh, you filed your application and now you're gonna get an office action and it will likely be a rejection. And that's not because we're mean, again, it's because we want to make the record clear as to what we think the closest art is. When you file, it's helpful if you've done a basic search, and again, we have um, the, the 800 number can help you, and every state has at least one called the Patent Repository Library, and they can actually help you search. And so if you do a search, it's, we recommend it just because you might find exactly <laughs> what you think you can then patent and save yourself all kinds of time and money. The other thing is you might find something close and you can say, oh, well, so you want to emphasize what your feature is. And I tell people, if you file an application with a three-page spec, while well, your examiner will be quite grateful because that'll be pretty easy. If you need to amend, you might be in trouble because if we find something, uh, I'll jump, uh, we have a slide on it, but basically if you have a very broad claim, a block with a hole in it, we're going to find that. So it may be that you're going to have to give us a lot of details about that block and the shape of the hole and the density of the material. And even though you know about that, if it isn't in your specification as originally filed, you can't add it without it being new matter, and uh, which means you would have to file what's called a continuation in part. So I tell people, whatever you think your invention is, put it in the specification and in the drawings. That's part of your spec. And you don't necessarily want to claim it all, although every once in a while we, we have an applicant who insists that we didn't put enough in their claim. And uh, you don't want a six page long claim because that'll be easy to you know, uh, overcome. But you do want a, spec, a specification that has enough information in there that if you need to amend it, you can. For example, you would like to just say that this thing is made out of metal. But if it turns out we find one made out of brass, but you thought, well, I, I really can make mine out of stainless steel, too, and we think that that's not an obvious thing. If you didn't say stainless steel in your specification, you can't come back and say, well, metal includes stainless steel. Yes, it does, but it's narrower. Now, if you, um, if you claimed, if you talked about stainless steel, you have stainless steel, and conversely, you can't say it's metal, because now you're broadening the claim, and we're, not, we're gonna say, well, how do we know that you, meant all metals. And I see somebody looking confused, I pop, but what I'm saying is you would want a specification that would say, you know, it's made out of metal. Uh, uh, preferred metals would include, and you just list anything you think it could be made out of. And um, then the other thing is when you get an office action, they will give you um, an information disclosure, I'm sorry, a notice of references cited. And I encourage you to look at those cited references Obviously, newer ones are going to be more helpful than older ones because you know the laws and the uh, rules have changed somewhat. But that way you can get an idea of the language of a claim. And I would look at those before I filed it too to get an idea. For example, I once got one that said drawings are available upon request. Not anymore, they're not. <laughs> Though that would be new matter automatically. And uh, again, you want to just, and again, you can go online. We have our database online. There's Google patents. I'm sure everybody knows that, so I'll, um, uh, this will be a quiz. <laughs> this is just a reference. It tells you the AI, I'm sorry, AI is America Invents Act, which is the, the big change in March of 2013 that changed from basically first, invent, first to invent to first to file. And uh, this will, uh, okay, the claims are what defines your invention. It doesn't matter what you tell us about in your specification. I mean, it does, but what you're going to get exclusive rights for are what you put in your claims. You can, you can talk about cold, oh, oh, I shouldn't say this, but there is a valid patent out there that there's nothing we can do about it, and the abstract and the specification talk about things going faster than light, and he knew it went faster than light because he had a tree, a plant, next to the wall where the fourth dimension opened, and the tree grew really, really fast. Unfortunately, he didn't have that in his claims. So, you know, he didn't get a patent protection for going faster than light and opening the fourth dimension and making this plant grow really, really fast. But it still makes us look stupid. It was not our happiest moment, but we couldn't. But if he had put that in the claims, he would not have gotten a patent. We hope. <laughs> we, we, have, we have screwed up. We are not perfect. Um, obviously, I am, and my examiners are, but there's some other ones that are not. 
And, um, and we have, unfortunately, an example of one later. And people think, you know, well, to me, it, it's a really good teaching example. And it also points out there is always a remedy. Well, almost always. Once you get to the nine wise one in, in DC, you're done. Um, ask Myriad. <laughs> But uh, if you don't like the examiner's decision, you can petition, which goes to, to, to me and to the directors. And if you don't like that um, based on art, you can go to the Board of Appeals, which is now called the Patent and, Trade PTAB, Patent and Trademark Appeal Board, PTAB, I think. It used to be the Board of Patent Appeals and Interferences. And if you don't like their decision, you can go to this uh, Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, CAFC, and if you don't like their decision, you can go to the Supreme Court. Now, the CAFC and the Supreme Court can refuse to consider your thing, but the board has to consider your, your case. There is, unfortunately, a very large backlog at the board right now. It's probably, uh, probably three years, I'm going to guess, although I did get one that was only up there for 14 days before they decided it. That's a really good sign. <laughs> Either I was so wrong or I was so right, and in this case, I was really right. The, it was pretty funny. So if you ever get a board decision like in three months, it means they cherry picked and saw this one was really easy to decide. But other than that, um, it'll be a couple of years. But the point is that there are, there are ways if you really feel that this isn't right, you just don't have to go, well, I'm screwed. Um, obviously, a lawyer does help you go to the board, but again, it is not required. Now here, if you have, so now you have claims a block with a hole in it. And if we find art on it, then we're going to apply this art, and now you're going to want to amend around it. Now, broader claims offer greater protection. So obviously, if you could manage to get a block with a hole in it, you'll be, you'll be rich because everyone with a cinder block or, to be honest, a brick, they have hole, you know, pores in it. It doesn't say through hole. You know, it's just a block with a hole in it. And um, so that's an example of broad language, which we'll get to hopefully. And uh, narrow claims also are needed. So I think there's a book called NOLO, um, Get Yourself a Patent. I have no financial interest in it, but a number of pro se's have used it. And I'd say some of them have done a pretty good job, at least as good as some uh, attorneys. And they suggest you want three claims, because you get three, uh, three independent claims. You pay for those no matter what. And you want the first one to be really broad, then kind of medium, and then the next one pretty narrow. And then underneath those, you can have some dependent claims you know, a block with a hole in it, a dependent claim would be the block of claim one, wherein the block is made out of concrete, et cetera. And uh, again, when you see other um, patents, you'll see that. So you get an office action and you have to respond to it. And you have to respond to everything or technically we can send you a non-responsive or non-compliant. Most examiners, if they can understand what you're doing, they'll just tell you, you forgot to, you know, you didn't answer this, I will assume you meant this and not make you, you know, waste your time. And um, so you even drawing objections, claim object, an objection is you put two periods at the end of the claim, you misspelled a word, et cetera. Those are, those are not a big deal. And uh, we'll get into the kinds of rejections in a second. We now encourage people to uh, request an interview. As you know, or you may not know, that um, the office is one of the leaders in teleworking. So we have examiners working all over the 48 contiguous United States plus Hawaii full time. But we have WebEx tools that they are required to know how to use, and they, they do. And uh, so you can get an interview in person, even though it's over a camera. I had someone come in the other day, and you know we just held it up to the camera with the examiner, and they could see all the details of it. And, um, a, and a phone interview or an in-person interview can really make a big difference. If you are pro se, you just call and ask for the interview or whatever. If you are represented by an attorney or an agent, by law, we cannot speak to you without that person present. That doesn't mean that you can't have an, an interview. It just means you have to have whoever your a attorney or agent is on the interview with you, either a conference call or in person or something. And the reason is, you know, that way there's no confusion as to, well, he told me this and she told me that. Now we're all on the same page. And again, uh, an appeal is a possibility if you just feel that there's nothing, you know, this is, they're just being unreasonable and I'm sure I'm right. Uh, short of an appeal, you basically get two tries. Uh, uh, you, whatever you filed, we will give you an office action. 
then you can amend around it and respond and we will give you another office action. If, if it's properly made final, then it's final. But now we have what's called the after final pilot, which is good through at least September 30th of this year and will probably be extended. And that means if it's just a small change after final, the examiner, you can file that. There's no fee for it. And um, other than any extension of time fee, you would need no matter what. And the examiner will look at a, a small amendment after final as long as it, it uh, narrows at least one claim. You can't just chop off half of a claim and say, I just want, that's, that's broadening the claim. And, uh, but basically, you get two office actions. And your choice then is to either abandon the case, go to appeals, or file what's called a request for continuing examination or a continuation or divisional, et cetera. And uh, the fee for a uh, continuation or an RCE is the same fee as though you filed a whole new application, but you just go on with the same thing. And sometimes it's, you know, especially if it's kind of complex or whatever, people deliberately want several iterations because they want everyone to see well, the examiner looked at Smith, and I overcame Smith. And then they applied Jones, and this is why Jones is no good. And, and, uh, and then the record is strong. Your competitor can still sue you, but he can't say, well, the examiner ought to have looked at Smith. And everyone's like, well, they didn't. And that's a very famous case recently called KSR versus Teleflex that went to the Supreme Court. And the whole issue was, should, should they have looked at this other reference? And this record was silent. And so someone paid to go to the Supreme Court over it. And um, so anyway, but you do have options if you, but what we say after a final or a non-final, I mean, after a final or an after final, you know, call the examiner, have an interview and say, hey, you know, is there a direction I should go? Am I throwing good money after bad? And, and you may disagree, but at least if they say, look, <laughs> you know, I just see nothing. Um, then you might know, I'm not going to waste with an RCE. I'm just going to go straight to appeals. Uh, trademarks, I don't know so much about, but we'll just kind of go through them. Is anyone particularly interested in trademarks? I do have special you know, presentations on it, but I'd be lying if I said. I can say that the, you, you have a trademark the minute it, it, it um, I'm sorry, wrong, that's copyright. <laughs> um, you don't have to file with, with us to get a, a trademark. You can have a state mark, and, uh, and you can just tell people, oh, I uh, consider it trademarked, but it's not very strong in that case. If you register it with the Patent and Trademark Office, it means we can ask customs to, you know, stop uh, forgers coming in, etc. But you know, we all know, you know, it's very hard. We have pretty porous bo borders, and it's very hard. Um, again, you know, these are the requirements, and uh, it can be in a handout. Uh, uh, copyright is not in our office. Currently, it's with the Library of Congress, and uh, they're looking at maybe changing the term. Right now, it's the author's life plus, well, you can read, plus 75, 70 years or 95 years or 120 years. And uh, the minute you write something, it is, in theory, copyrighted. But again, if you register it, you get stronger protection. And um, it includes musical works, you know, books, pictures, uh, so I think there was a big case about a month ago about whether somebody stole, I can't, it was a very popular song, and Marvin Gaye's family is getting like $7 million or something. And uh, trade secrets, we don't have anything to do with those. And that's basically the famous one is Coca-Cola. They have never disclosed to anyone, least of all us, what's in Coca-Cola. And so they get to keep exclusive rights for that forever, unless someone figures it out. <laughs> and if they do, uh, let's say Pepsi actually cracks the formula. As long as they didn't steal it, but they independently came up with it, Pepsi can file a patent, and Coca-Cola will not be able to use their own formula because it's been disclosed. It's it's out for more than a year, and uh, so if you have a trade secret, you really want to make sure it's a secret, <laughs> and um, you know there's no cost to it. It's just your little. You know, what's that? Bush's baked beans and the dog, and um. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's, based, that's kind of an overview. And I will go on to the next one, which is a little bit more detailed. Of course, I have old, so it's hard to read without. Uh, I think even though this one sounds more complicated than it is, it's not. And I think, um, is everyone here kind of interested in what we, how we interpret claims and how, how you would need to write them? 
more than the life of an examiner type thing. Okay. Okay, uh, we will do where's the slideshow. Um, okay, so before you now you you've got this idea. Before you draft your claims, think, you know, hopefully you've looked at some other applications. What is my invention? It's great to say, you know, I'm using this polyurethane to line a ditch, but your invention is not lining a ditch with polyurethane. Your invention is you made polyurethane from carbon and this, that, and the other, and you, it has UV resistant properties, and your invention is really not ditch laying. So whatever your inventive concept is, you kind of want to get that in your independent claim. And then dependent claims or claims you add later can have more specific applications, et cetera. And that I hinted on before that you will get the best examination if all of your claims as filed relate to your inventive concept. If you have a method of making polyurethane and the last claim is it's used to line a ditch, people that, that examine ditches are going to look at a method of making polyurethane out of carbon. And while we all have engineering degrees, some of us are in you know, software or business, we wouldn't know how to make polyurethane if you beat us with a stick. But if you put it in our area, we'll have to and we'll do our best. So what I tell people is limit your claims to what really think about who do I want to be examining this. And then after a first action, you can amend and say a dependent claim, it's used to line a ditch, it's used to make raincoats, et cetera. But um, does that make sense? And again, that's not an official rule of the office, but it's something that I have found. So you want to think about what's your invention, what are the pieces and parts, and how do they relate to each other. While you can have more than, you can have a, an apparatus, a method of making, um, we will probably restrict that out. And that just means that if you get an apparatus allowed finally, we will rejoin the method of making it. But we won't examine them all at once because it's, again, the Constitution says you get uh, uh, an, appara uh, um, uh, an article of manufacture or a process. And we recently got a claim which is, I think, the best one I've ever seen. It is a system comprising an apparatus and a method as described herein that has a rejection under every category possible. And we don't know what on earth it is. And it mixed, it's a 101 because it's two statutory classes as described herein. That's called an omnibus claim. And uh, they just wasted their whole first action. We can reject that on a chair. I don't know, it's an apparatus and there's a method in there I would sit in it. And so, you know, you, you want to make sure you have a claim that makes some sense. Um, and uh, so are there, oh, we're getting to this one. Whoops, just a minute. Um, this one, is, that's our website. So again, I would recommend doing your own patent search first. And oh, look on the internet. Um, you know, uh, not everyone patents everything, and conversely, everything that's patented isn't always sold. A lot of times, and especially with pro se's, we feel real bad when we find exactly what they have. But I tell them, and it makes them feel better, and it's true. I was like, this means that you had such a good idea that somebody else beat you to it, but you still, you, you took the first step. You are an inventor. And I had a pro se once, Danny, who was one of my very first, and he called me in tears, and, I was, and he had a seventh grade education and worked in the mines, and he invented these foam blocks that prevent fires from spreading in the mines. He used this NOLO book. Or, and, um, you know, I was like, that's kind of cool. And, um, you know, he, uh, he, he probably didn't get the broadest claims in the world because he didn't have that much support in his spec. But he was the, he is really what the office is here for. He had a better idea, and he didn't just sit there and grumble, his stupid boss doesn't even know what he's doing. We initiated, or, or whatever, the concept that if you have a better idea, go get your exclusive rights. Make your boss pay you for them. And, uh, and that is really the crux of, I think, the American, uh, what's unique about our economy, and it's why patents are important. I don't mean to pro proselytize, but really, um, you know, uh, we used to say that, you know, students were the inventors of tomorrow, but as we have all seen, they're the inventors of today. You are the inventor of today. Don't think, well, after I get that PhD or after I, no, you know, all kind, look at the post-it note. That was a mistake. And, um, you know, that's making a ton of money and it's just like a funny glue. <laughs> 
And um, so you don't ever know what what's going to be the thing. Maybe your first invention, you, it, it won't be novel, somebody else, but it means that you're getting, you, you realize that you are an inventor and that you can profit from your ideas. And that, you know, that's how businesses grow. And the next thing you know, you'll be on Shark Tank. <laughs> and um, so the when you think of your invention and you have some prior art, look and see why is mine different? Why is mine, it doesn't have to be better. Um, I say that with great shame because, you know, unfortunately a patent does not mean it's better. It doesn't mean that it is legal. People don't realize that a patent isn't the right to sell it. It is the right to exclude others. And the best example is marijuana. Ten years ago, if you had a method of smoking marijuana and you had this really good pipe and it whatever, hey, you can't sell that. It's illegal. So you could have still gotten a patent for it because you're going to get it for 20 years and maybe the law will change. And what do you know it did? So I'm guessing anyone that got a patent back then is, is thinking they're pretty smart. And so that's the best example of, you know, it, it is only the right to exclude others from doing it. It is not the right to sell it yourself. And sometimes on those late night commercials, you'll have them say, so new it's patented, so great it's patented. A, it's often a design patent for the box. I've looked them up sometimes and often it's the patent for the box. Or it's such a, a weird patent that it's it's not what you think it's for. It's not for the drug itself. It's for, you know, a, a new shape of the capsule or something. But my, my point is that, you know, a patent is as, is as valuable as, well, you can help determine how valuable your patent is by, and how likely you are to get it by thinking, you know, what is it that makes mine to me better? Why do I think it's going to sell? And those are the features you want in your claims. And to have them in your claims, you need to have them in your spec. And um, so you want to see, okay, I have a ladder. And, um, you know, why is your ladder different? It could be that you have a special shape to the rung so that it, it resists, it, it can hold more weight with less material. You know, something like that. You didn't invent a ladder, but you invented, you know, a different way to make it. Um, we have a lot of firemen in that area and of course my examiners always make fun of me because when I hear it's a fireman I'm like you better not make it final without really trying to help him. And uh, they'll have things like a, a method of tying a knot, you know, method of jumping out a window. In the 30s they were great patents. <laughs> Everyone jumped out a window. They put wings on their clothes. They put a parachute on their hat. And my favorite, they put a spring on their hat and on their shoes so that no matter which end you landed on, you would be okay. Again, we didn't say it would work. <laughs> we didn't say it was a good idea, we just said it was different. And um, so, uh, again, you want the broadest valid claim. You've done yourself no favor to get a broad claim that's issued that's just, you, you know it's meaningless. I had someone once with an attorney file an application and claim one was, a paving stone on a graded bed of sand. I did not search it. I went to my backyard and I took a picture of my brick patio and I did an examiner's affidavit and said I paid someone to do this in 1998. And that's it, I can actually do that. And um, so I'm like, why would anyone even try to get a patent for that? Let's say I didn't know what I was doing. You think you can enforce that? Um, no, you really can't. And so they, oh, this is our current fees, and there will be a quiz immediately afterwards. I hope everyone memorized them. That's just there that, you know, you can see it's on our website, and it's current as of about a month ago, and I don't think they've changed. But it kind of gives you an idea that you can see 280 to 140 to 70 is the basic filing fee. So it's, if you do it yourself, you're timely on everything, you can easily get to an allowance at under $1,000. And um, you can easily go for 40000 too. It just depends on, you know, the, again, if I had cold fusion, I wouldn't care. I would figure out what to spend or, you know, I had a drug that cured cancer. Well, hopefully you would want to share that, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, now we're getting to some examples. A generic claim that uh, I, I like, I have a different one that, um, here's a roller skate having at least three wheels. And that's going to be harder to see. So there's a species that has three wheels, and then there's a species that has four wheels, 
and a, a roller skate that has five wheels because all of those are covered by a roller skate having at least three wheels. Similarly, they didn't have to say having at least three. They could have just said a roller skate comprising three wheels. And one of the things that you will probably know, but if not, you should, there are no two words more different in patents than the words comprising and consisting. If you had a roller skate consisting of three wheels, that's it. You can't have more than three wheels. You can't have a toe stopper because consisting of means there is nothing that is a part of that that, that isn't following the word consisting. We, we rarely will see consisting unless that's exactly what they want. But if you say a roller skate comprising at least, or just comprising three wheels, it could have at least three, it has to have three wheels, it could have 17 wheels, it can have a toe stop, it can have an adjustable back plate, it can have a little bit of everything on it. And um, so I personally don't think I would have called that these are, these are species. A species is supposed to be mutually exclusive and four wheels includes three wheels. So again, we're not allowed to kind of change some of these things for these, to get a slide approved is, you know, it's the government, it'll be six months. Um, but, you know, uh, they are certainly different. Now we're starting to get ones that are truly more species. If they have four wheels and a spring mechanism, uh, well, the best example I always give people is a pen. You have a generic claim, a pen. You're not going to get a patent for that, but if you do, you're really going to be rich if you can enforce it. Then that's claim one, and now claim two is the pen of claim one comprising a retractable tip. Claim three is the pen of claim one comprising a felt tip that does not retract. And claim four is the pen of claim one comprising a quill that is uh, that, an ink from an inkwell. Those are mutually exclusive. If you have a quill, it is not a ballpoint pen. It is not a magic marker. So that is properly restrictable. And what that means is you can get one, you get the generic claim, a pen, and one species will be examined. And that one species, if you can get an allowable claim, anything that can read off of it will be rejoined. But it, I don't think you will ever get a generic claim that will allow you to have a pen and then these, these three things as distinct species. So that's kind of the, what I, my, again, this is not my favorite slide, but they didn't ask me. Uh, this is the one I think that everyone will laugh at. This unfortunately did issue. It is a um, animal toy, and it wouldn't be so bad except they gave us a picture and it looks an awful lot like a stick. And, uh, and that's probably because if you get to the claims, an animal toy comprising a solid main section having a diameter and a longitudinal length and extending a predetermined distance along said longitudinal length and at least one protrusion attached, uh, that's a stick, the animal toy of claim one, wherein the main section is formed of rubber, claim three, it's formed of plastic. That we would have to make what's called a 103. We would have to go find another animal toy that's made of plastic or rubber and say, well, claim two is rejected. Smith, or I would say, is rejected, you know, a stick, which we can do. We can go Xerox a stick and say, you know, it was out there three years ago. And, um, and it would be obvious to make it out of rubber because, you know, it's, animal toys are known to be out of that. And uh, so then we get to claim four. The main section includes a wood. A stick again, that's a 102. Uh, five includes cellulose, uh, that's wood. <laughs> um, main section includes a flavoring. Well, the inventor probably, well, assuming that he wasn't doing this on purpose, he probably meant that he made this thing and he added, like, you know, whatever, uh, that, the way we would read that, most the, most the broadest reasonable interpretation, a stick includes a flavoring to my dog. He thinks that thing tastes delicious. And that's a valid 102 still. It includes a scent. My dog thinks it smells. Uh, eight and nine are really a good example of, they both come off of claim one. So technically these would be restrictable. Something cannot, the same thing cannot be both rigid and flexible, except their relative terms. Uh, a stick is rigid compared to a cooked spaghetti noodle, and it's flexible compared to a steel I-beam. So it, if 
if claim nine depended on claim eight, there would be a problem because if we said it's rigid, we can't then say the same thing is, is flexible. Does that make sense? But we can say that this thing is rigid and then a, a, a separate claim that doesn't, doesn't come off of the rigid or flexible one, well, now we're looking at it compared to a different thing. So flexible to, uh, relative terms include things like big and small, and uh, I, that's something a lot of small inventors, and to be honest, some attorneys, you know, they know what they mean, but we know how we are going to read it. And so if you get a rejection, don't sit there and think, that examiner's just being a pain. No, we're, we're telling you that this is what your competitors, this is what someone else will be running to court saying we should have done. Um, the material is lighter than water, wood floats. Uh, fluorescent covering, okay, we'd make a 103. Camouflage coating, uh, camouflage is the whole point of it, is to make it look like stick. And it's formed out of wood, and there were some other claims. Anyway, as you can imagine, the office was not as happy as they could be about this, but it did issue. And if a patent issues improperly based on art, we can do a re-exam. The office can order a re-exam, which is very rare, but we ordered a re-exam on this. That meant the office paid for the re-exam. Uh, if you managed to get a claim that went faster than light in a claim, you got it for good. We don't have art on that. We should have rejected it under 101 as breaking a law of nature. But again, I don't think you're going to be able to enforce it. Um, but you have succeeded in making the office look stupid for a long time. This one, someone decided that, um, oh, that we should have found that. And so the director ordered a re-exam and miraculously, you can tell it's a re-exam because, well, it says so. And uh, claims 1 through 20 are now canceled. And there were only 20 claims. So that is an example, and, you know, again, I... I think it's a good example because people are going to remember a stick. If I did some weird thing, you're all going to, I don't know what she's talking about. But you know, you can make something very common sound complicated. You could describe a cube in three pages, you know, this, this side with right angles and blah, blah. Bottom line is it's a cube, two words. So the famous, it's a pencil test. There's a, an old saying that examiners used a pencil. And if the claim was longer than a pencil, we allowed it. And that as the quarter got, longer and you know longer and we needed our counts our pencil got shorter and our standard for allowable claims got shorter that's really not true again a cube is two words and three pages describing a cube is still a cube but um anyway so that one is you know not valid but we're not the only ones that make a mistake sometimes inventors make them and um if everything is just to the same thing, you just re then you know there's nothing wrong with it except you you put all your eggs in that basket, um, and so maybe you you want to have uh, it's not mutually exclusive but different features. If we go back to a ballpoint pen, you could have you know that it's a ballpoint pen, and then you could say this chain is all about the retractable mechanism, and then you have another in a set of claims that's still to a ballpoint pen. But in this one, you're really interested in the ink that's in the pen. Well, the ink wouldn't matter whether how the retractable mechanism works. And so you want to you know, do that um, uh, rather than have them all come off the same thing, because if so, that means that the ink will only, you only have coverage if it's got that same spring mechanism, if it's got that you know, all the way up in a hierarchy, whereas the, if you break it out, You've got to set a ballpoint pen that has these features and then the same ballpoint pen and now I'm emphasizing you know, the kind of ink or the retraction mechanism or you know, the, the plastic that the barrel is made out of and that you know, you're covered. If you, if you have a ballpoint pen and the retract, retraction mechanism, anybody that has that, you have patent rights on it. And just because they have a different ink doesn't matter. You, you didn't limit yourself by the ink. Does that make sense? That's probably one of the cruxes of patents that you want to, to get the concept of that. Um, uh, and, and sometimes there's a, there's a branch that it won't work. You know, we've, too many people have it. And, but that doesn't mean that you know, it's not something you might not know. The examiner might not know until they search. 
hopefully you should know that a block on a graded bed of sand is never going to be patentable and you wasted your money. Okay, so again, you want to have a variety. And so if the broadest claim isn't allowable, nothing that you um, do can, can change that, but you can have dependent claims that narrow it down. You're not going to get a pen, but if you have a weird mechanism for that retraction, maybe you'll get that. And uh, one thing I suggest, and again, a small inventor, pro se, doesn't necessarily have the resources. There are searching patent search firms that you can hire, but if you know of the best art and you disclose it, A, you, you swear that you, you did, that you, anything you know about, but the courts have actually held, because I went to the board on one, that um, if, the, if you disclose it, they won't say that, that, hey, well, you didn't try to sneak it by us, but I think they think that because I had one that went and the board was very clear that they gave this reference greater weight because the applicant did not disclose it and it was their own <laughs> and the examiner had to find it. So it kind of, no one will ever say liar, liar, pants on fire, but we can think it sometimes and so can the board. And so, you know, especially if it's something you know that everybody knows, disclose it and then you can explain up front well, this is really like mine, but mine is, an, mine is so much different, and this is why. This is why it's critical. This is why it's important. A good example is a round hole with a, a round peg in it. A lot of times we, we have a form paragraph that says change in shape. And if, well, change in shape is only obvious if there's no real benefit. And I had an examiner one time when I was in fasteners, and um, you know, that somebody changed the shape to be square or whatever, and they said it's a change in shape. And I said, no, that's a huge difference because if you put a, you know, the shaft in a square, they have to rotate together, whereas a certain round, they, that is, that is a patentable, you know, that matters. So if you get a rejection that, you know, there's a reason that you, you did this and you told us what it was, um, the, the examiner really shouldn't be giving you, oh, it'd be obvious to make it square because it's just a change in shape. That, that does have, but, you know, painting it blue, well, there's no, you know, blue's pretty, orange is pretty. And um, so the other thing is, you know, just because the examiner says it, you know, you can argue with them. And, um, oh, let's see. Ah, no. Ah. Oh, I guess this is a new slide. Um, that um, we publish applications now unless you tell us not to. And um, we, we love published applications because they're easier to, to search. And um, so again, you have a provisional that gives you the earlier date, and we have to beat that date by at least one day, and really by at least a year, because you can usually go back and swear behind it. And um, let's see, uh, I think we've kind of covered most of that. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the pen was similar to that, and this is the widget, and I think the pen is easier to understand. Here's the paper clip, and here we have three different paper clips. Well, a generic claim would be, you know, uh, an apparatus comprising uh, a shaped piece of metal that is capable of holding paper. Now, if you say that holds paper, that's a difference. Capable of hold or configured to hold paper you're not claiming the combination. You're just claiming a clip that could be used with paper. If you say, uh, uh, you know, holding paper, you now have the combination, and to have exclusive rights to it, they've got to, you've got to sell it with paper or whatever. So oftentimes people want the subcombination, the the the, pay, the the clip alone, but they need to claim it in combination, you know, to make to make it have sense. And in that case. What you want to do is use configured to, and that uh, a good thing you can't you can't claim a body part. And when I did jewelry, you know, people would always be a ring, um, you know, that that is that uh, worn on the finger. Worn on the finger means I gotta have a finger on it. You're not gonna sell a whole lot of rings with a finger on it. And so what you want is configured to be wearable or worn, and that you're just claiming the ring, and you won't get a 101. And uh, so, and I think you can all figure out that, you know, the broadest thing, and then this is obviously, you would describe the shape, this is a different shape, these are made, it, these, these, here's one that you would say consisting of a bent piece of metal, and that would be consisting, because there's nothing there but a bent piece of metal. And this one is also consisting of a bent piece of metal, 
this one is not consisting of, it comprises a bent piece of metal. It actually comprises two bent pieces of metal and a bent piece of, uh, I guess metal wire, excuse me, and this would be a bent piece of metal plate. And uh, so that's an example of different embodiments and the generic to the narrow. Does that make sense to people? If I'm going too fast, I'm sorry, but I don't want to run out of time, which, whoop, which we are doing. But um, that uh, I have a whole presentation on obviousness. That is the, the really the un great unknown of patenting is exactly where is that line. And everyone's line is a little bit different. I'd be lying if I said every examiner is going to have the exact same standard of what's obvious to do. Um, and that's where arguing and evidence comes in. And the word evidence is really important because to overcome something with an opinion is pretty hard. I had a man that in, he invented a mine bolt from Canada and he, he came down for an interview right after September 11th to Washington DC, changed planes in New York and he brought these mine bolts on a plane and it's like the world's best all-purpose hijack a plane. It's about a one inch piece of a rod of of carbon steel and it goes out in a frustaconical cone so that you could you know bash things with it and then it tapers down to a screwdriver tip that is beveled and sharp so you can slit their throats you can pry open a door and he carried it on a he was really nice looking and I guess the stewardesses thought and anyway I had gotten this thing and I searched online and I found the Jaeger bolt and I just I called it that it was a bolt that J-A-E whatever and I thought well it looks just like it and so I said, well, it's obvious over the Jaeger bolt. And then when he got to the angle of the bevel, I said, it'd be obvious to make it that angle. You'd make it the angle you need to, to wedge it in there. Well, he came down and his arguments weren't doing any good because it was his opinion. And then he was flipping through and I saw this great, he won a prize for the best innovation in mining by the National Association of Mine, Canadian Mining Association. And their little thing said it was, and I quote, a step improvement over the Jaeger bolt. I told him, I said, sir, you're making the wrong argument here. May I borrow this and may I Xerox it? That is everything. It is an independent authority. I will certainly say they know more about mine bolts than I am. Now, if he had his opinion that it was a step improvement, that's not evidence. That's an opinion. It might be true, but it might not be persuasive. And uh, I would have... I would have very much faulted anyone who maintained the, the, the Jaeger rejection after seeing that, that these experts said it was a step improvement. Done, done, done. So that evidence is really important. If you get into things like, I don't want to get too complicated, but secondary considerations. Let's just say we have exactly what you have, obviousness. And uh, you say, no, no, but mine suddenly sold 10 million of them. And so that shows a long felt need or whatever. That's going to be somewhat hard because there are market factors involved. It might not be because of that. Maybe you paid off your competitor. Maybe you're crooked. You know, maybe, you know, all kinds of things. And um, whereas if you made a fastener and you got a statement from Boeing that said, this what, making this out of this material was not allowed by our specs. Our specs said it had to be, you know, A, B, C, or D. And he made it out of E and proved to us that this was much better. It weighs less and it's much stronger. That's actually true. This happened. And I'm like, he's not, he's not um, Boeing. Boeing said this. I considered that to be enough that it can't be obvious to make something out of material that your largest customer said you can't do. And, uh, but had he just said that, I would have said, well, that's your opinion. And not because I'm mean, but because I would have really thought that's, that's your opinion. And novelty is exact, a 102. We found exactly what it is. Obviousness is uh, two or more references or one reference that we said, it'd be obvious to paint it blue because blue is, it just makes it decorative. Um, and the, it, uh, if, if the examiner just uses what's called case law to reject it for obviousness, that is, possibly something you can argue. You can come back and say, well, that's not exactly the situation of mine. A good example is duplication of parts. Sometimes duplicating parts really matter. Sometimes, let's say it's a pipe fitting, whether you have, you know, a Y or a T or a, a cross, you know, you can put, ten, they duplicate them. It doesn't, it's not an inventive step really. 
The converse is wheeled luggage. Two wheels. I'll be honest, if I'd seen four-wheeled luggage, I would have believed it was obvious until the cows came home. I now believe it's the greatest invention since sliced bread. Yes? If you're seeing the very novel sort of thing, mm -hmm. oh, sorry. If you're in a field where, um, for historical reasons, there's a number of things that have happened and it's quite far from the common pattern. It, it, right. it, what's obvious? And that, that is, again, if you have a reason in your spec, if you say, um, you know, the, the, this material, um, uh, I found through trials that it gave the unexpected result of an increased uh, resistance to wear, or, you know, we, we expect titanium to be light and strong. But if you discover that um, uh, no one would have expected titanium to be, um, uh, well, that's, that's all bad. Um, but, you know, actually, titanium isn't any good if you're going to use it with a dilute acid. But can, um, can I? Sure. Um, suppose you're trying to produce an optimal solution to something that's very important, and you have a team of able people who work a long time iterating to come to the, um, you know, with mathematics and whatever right. is handy, um, and experimental work to come to the best possible way to do something. Right. The, be the optimal solution will involve many, many conceptualizations from, from discussion and effort and sweat and the rest. And there's a very big question, and one what's obvious, um, and and Mark, when is it hindsight and when is it an invention? It, it, yeah. Th and again, Thomas Edison somewhat... always asked, what's the most obvious damn thing I can possibly do right here? Right. And you know, it's a very good question because obvi it's obvious and elegant and, and fit. Right. Well, I would say that's where a specification is important. If you have the basis in the spec, if you don't tell us anything about why you did something, and then you want to make that be very important, we can say, well, we're not sure you knew that yet. I had a case that went to the board on that very thing. And um, uh, he came in after we rejected it and said, oh, well, I, this is why it's important. And you know, I was like, well, you didn't tell us that. Maybe you learned that two weeks ago. And um, so if you have, if there's a criticality for it, you need to explain it in the specification. Well, we will we cannot use that against you. Say, well, it'd be obvious to do it because the caveat is if you say I'm making it out of titanium because titanium is light and strong, well, even though you told us that, it's well known. So that would not be support. But if you said titanium, it is found that, you know, if you stick titanium in uh, uh, the core of a reactor, it becomes plastic or something, you know, um, and that wasn't expected, then that would be something that would matter, that making it out of titanium would have a new and unexpected benefit. Um, but that's, that's kind of, the, that's what the Supreme Court is there for, and they don't always agree. Um, the, uh, again, with, um, like with, uh, I'm trying to think of, I can't think of a good one for, for just obviousness. The, the best one I can think of, of course, is that mine bolt that, you know, I'm not exactly sure why that angle mattered, but I would no defer no. to, and he had it, he had the angle in there. Obviously, he would have preferred to just get, you know, whatever, but, you know, there's no way that I'm going to argue with the Canadian, the mining, Asso National Mining Association of Canada. That is, to me, objective evidence. And um, he had that angle in there. Now, if he'd never talked about the angle, and, well, maybe it was that angle, maybe it wasn't, but he never said that, and he needed to claim an angle to get around my art, then he can't do that, because it would be new matter. And in, the, in this case, that award from Canada, it talked about how this angle really mattered, and I was like, done, done, it's not, I would have thought it was obvious if you make the angle like this, well, make the angle like that. And I said smaller angles would make a sharper point, you know, and, and uh, well, uh, they didn't think it was obvious at all. They thought it was a step improvement. And um, so it, is that answering your, I don't think I have. Well, um, in, in retrospect, the best work you do looks obvious. Oh yeah, and that instant. is, that, yeah, hindsight is that, in hindsight, everything looks obvious. And, and, and we're not supposed to use hindsight. On, if you've got a good team working on something that's utterly new, mm -hmm. 
Um, if they keep at it, the most important um, the, the most important discoveries happen. Well, in that case, for example, like we said earlier, you would have a lab book with you know dates of, and if you can show, you would come into the examiner and say no, you know, look at the difference, but especially in a chemical area, that you know we all know the difference of 0.01 percent can make a huge difference, whereas. You know, to be honest, the difference in 0.01% on the length of a screw, it's pretty obvious it's just longer because it's going to go into thicker things. And uh, the important thing is that you have the evidence in there, and then you would come back and explain. I tried it at 0.01, and, and then all of a sudden, between 0.01 and 0.02, you know, it took off like that. That's um, a pretty, you know, it became this much stronger. Normally, we would expect... You know more of a linear curve but um, now if you do that and you say it was unexpected we might go back and find somebody else that found the same whoop it took right off but um, but the you know if it really is something that no one expected and it gave you a uh, an unexpected benefit that you know then that would be a secondary consideration that would be accepted but then you then you get something that's unexpected yes and and like an old, you get something like it that's unexpected. An old patent lawyer of mine talked about a new, new, new field where you were like a dog in the woods. Everywhere you looked, a tree. Right. <laughs> um, once you've made the big jump, which may have you know been a gut wrenching and and an improbable thing. Right. Things open up, and the very first time you see them, many of the most um, most important things. They've never been disclosed before. Right. This is a new field, and yet, once you're there, they're obvious. Right. Again, it's probably not as complicated, but the four wheeled luggage is for me. I've told that to my examiners. I said I would have rejected four wheels as obvious over two wheels until the cows came home. And fortunately, I didn't examine that. But if you've ever bought a four wheeled suitcase, it's a lot oh, more it is convenient. such a huge improvement over two wheels. And I. I don't think I'm that stupid, but I wouldn't have thought about it. I mean, I would have thought, well, if it rolls on two wheels, it rolls on four wheels. But the idea that you don't have any weight on your back and it can go sideways down the aisle, whereas, you know, it won't. And that is the kind of thing you would want that in your specification. And, you know, and if you didn't have it, then it's going to be hard to argue that you knew that you had possession of that. So your, remedy, you, your remedy is specification history. Yes. And again, someone, you know, again, the examiner could come back and say, no, I would have, anyone would have known that four wheels would give you this. Well, then you can maybe start, you know, saying uh, a commercial success. And um, that's, again, harder because there, there can be so many variables. You undercut your competitors. But again, the, the office and the examiner, you know, to be honest, we all want to issue patents. We make our big money on issues. We don't make any money examining. And my pension is determined, is funded by your maintenance and allowance fees. In addition, my work is done. No one's going to argue it's much easier. So we want to allow it if we have, if we feel that we can legitimately say, hey, it's allowable. And, uh, you know, no one wants to just, well, I won't say, but in general, you know, it is not in anyone's interest to reject something when, when it's just not rejectable. But we, we, we also have to, find where that balance is between we're being the broadest reasonable definition and oh no you are stretching that thing so far when I have new examiners it's kind of like porn I tell them I'm like you know when you're typing that rejection and your stomach starts going I can't believe I'm typing this manure that's a real good sign that you're typing manure and you need to if you're not a primary come and see me and you know it's it's quite likely it's allowable but you can also put six references together in a 103 and have it be dead on that the novel concept, you know, it's a ladder and you needed one reference to teach it was made out of aluminum and another to teach that, you know, it had the little hinge thing in between and another to say it had the fold out paint can holder. Sticking a bunch of well-known things together is not patentable, but if it suddenly transforms and it, it performs so much better, that's patentable. And I don't think I have it on here. I have a custom form paragraph, which I stole with permission from Peter Sullivan, a lawyer in New York. He wrote it as an amicus brief in KSR versus Teleflex. I went and saw that at the Supreme Court. I love to go to the Supreme Court hearings. So I read the amicus briefs, and he has the best 
argument, and he quotes Thomas Jefferson, and it's something about, it was a letter from Thomas Jefferson to somebody, and it said, if we know about the hopper boy and the plow, or blah, 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 and it says, if we know, if, if we have possession of using a fork and a knife and a spoon separately, surely it cannot be patentable to combine their uses thereof, because if so, the patent office would take more away from us than it gives us. And it's said much better, but it's really addressing obviousness and hindsight and where that line is. Surely, you know, if you know to use a fork to spear your meat, and, you know, using them together probably isn't patentable. But there are times when combining two things together would be. And that's what I meant by obviousness is really the crux of a 102 is pretty easy it's pretty cut and dried although occasionally you'll have somebody argue it and maybe maybe you did read something wrong but the 103 is where and that's where if I were an inventor I would want very broad interpretations used to give me a chance to rebut them so that my patent is strong and um and again maybe you may think that the examiner's been unreasonable and maybe they are but I'm pretty confident in saying they're not doing it because it's fun to be unreasonable. They, they really do believe that. And again, may, you know, they're not going to be as knowing, no one knows more about your invention than you. And so if you can make a persuasive argument with some evidence, examiners would love to accept that and, and, and allow it. Um, I have these spoons that are, I believe, belong to John Marshall. And I've always heard that they were, and I offered them to the Supreme Court. They have their own, like, little museum. And it was funny. They, they looked at them, and they said, it's the right date. It's everything's the hallmark is right. But I don't have provenance because I don't know how on earth we got them. And they're like, you know, without provenance. And I just wanted to donate them. And I'll be honest. They want, they want to believe they're theirs because they get them. And so, but if I can find anything, you know, my great-great-grandmother married, you know, John Marshall's third cousin that would probably do it and I just I everyone that would have known is dead but it's the same kind of thing they want to believe it but I have to have just enough to let them make it oh yeah that that makes sense and that the examiner wants to to find a reason to allow things but not, without being unfair to the public or to your competitors and so if you have evidence and arguments um, that that's you that that can be enough to do it but it's often just easier to if you if you know that there's another feature you didn't claim that yours has to do or has to have an amendment doesn't always narrow your claims it might rule out some art but if yours has to have that feature to work adding that feature to it won't won't weaken or or I don't think it really narrows um, your patent your patent strength and a lot of times when we're looking to do an examiner's amendment and allow something, I'll tell my examiners, I'm like, work with the applicant to find something that his has to do and that you don't have and, um, and that, that you know would destroy the base reference to do it. And there is not an attorney in the world that won't say, yeah, I'll go for that. But they, no one wants to say, you know, a picture claim that it's four pages and you tell us where every screw is and that can be, and that's what some of the late night commercial people don't tell you, is that's how they guarantee you to get a patent. And um, I'm sorry, oh, Kathleen, sorry, we're yeah. out of time. Yes, I'm sorry, So yes. um, if you have questions for Kathleen, I encourage you to stay after and ask some questions. Other and again, if you want uh, any of the handouts, I can email them to you. And um, let me put the ones that I'm using. And, uh, so thank you. I hope I, I hope